Hey everyone, it's Retro DM Ray. I'm back with you on the channel. Um, I'm hoping you're liking and digging the new intro. Um, if you like this content, remember as always, please like, share, give me a sub. Um, that thumbs up is really helpful. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you share with others. Um, you can check out the Patreon. I'm still looking for um, more patrons to uh, show up on there or express some interest in the comments um, so that I can start adding some rewards on there uh, for you to do that. Um, I appreciate um, all of you who have already subbed, and I thank you for uh, the comments that you have made throughout this course of these videos. It's been really encouraging me to continue to do it. Um, so I'm back again with you uh, for another video in our uh, Best of Dragon series. Um, again, today this is Best of Dragon from the Strategic Review and the Dragon Volumes 1 and 2. Uh, this was originally printed uh, copyright 1985, but the articles come from 75 through 78. Um, and this one is a short article today, uh, but I just thought it was kind of cool um, to bring you some stuff from uh, James Ward. You would recognize him as a really old school guy who's been around since uh, nearly the beginning of uh, Dungeons and Dragons um, as a game. Um, so I thought it would be neat for you to hear from James Ward. Um, this article is entitled, Notes from a Semi-Successful D&D Player. <laughs> Um, I really like that title, so I hope you enjoy this one today um, and get a little bit out of this one. So he says, uh, I've been traveling around dungeons for a considerable period of time now, and in that time I have thought up and copied many little tricks that have gotten me out of some tight spots. I am setting them down in the hope that someone will profit by them. It also wouldn't hurt if others sent their little tricks in, remembering that sometimes we need all the help we can get. The first is the creation of a continual light wand. This small baton will give a heatless light in a 24-foot area. It is much better than a torch because you can throw them in an unknown room and they don't go out. It is only a second-level spell, so it's easy to make. The baton can be kept in a leather holding pouch if darkness is desired. To carry the concept one step further, you could put the spell on arrows, and when they hit those monsters used, used to the darkness, the effect would be near blindness. Um, also, by the way, if you do that, um, then that would likely, um, if your dungeon master is so inclined, give you a bonus to hit them and give them a minus to hit you depending on where you hit them with the arrow uh, since that light is right in their face. Uh, the second idea needs the fourth level growth plant spell and a plant control potion. When I have the potion, I carry around a small potted rose plant in the dungeon. If the situation arises where I'm trapped in one of those ever popular dead ends and the monster's bearing down on me, the rose bush gets enlarged into a wall and I order it to attack the monster. It is truly gratifying to see the effect of those thorns on the hide of the monster. Everyone knows of the usefulness of a 10-foot pole in many tight places. The use of a 5-foot steel rod is even more useful in those tight places. You can hang from it, and it will not break like the wooden version. It is great for the stopping of those sliding walls. Last, but certainly not least, is its use as a lever of great power. While we are on the subject of steel, the use of steel potion bottles almost completely ends the chance of breaking them when you fall into a pit or you get hit. I say steel because if you make them out of iron, you could get poisoned. They might be expensive to make, but so is your potion. Everyone knows that vampires cannot stand the smell of garlic. While this is true, vampires can stand off in the distance some of those wolves and bats that are not bothered a bit by the smell. What I do is carry around small vials of garlic juice that I have squeezed from the buds. If you think the smell of the bud is strong, you should smell the juice. These vials are then thrown at the vampire or just in front of it. I usually get them to turn into dust or gaseous form with this sort of attack. The vials are kept in small steel pouches on my belt, of course. The polymorph spell can be one of the best double attack spells known if you use it right. For instance, if a cockatrice attacks and you succeed in turning it into a if you if you succeed in turning it into a snail, you should capture the snail. Then in the next battle, the snail is thrown in first with a dispel magic following it. The snail becomes a cockatrice, and if it survives the transformation, it fights your battle for you. 
If you do not want to bother with the keeping of your polymorph creatures, I suggest you turn them into a goldfish, so at least they die right away. We do not want those creatures coming around again for later revenge. <laughs> but that's really, really cool. Uh, then there is the poison on a dagger trick, which every judge is always trying to stop. I've been told that poison evaporates, poisons exposed to the air lose their effectiveness, or the most used of all, in your area there is no poison strong enough to kill the things you want to kill. I suggest that all you players, and especially the magic users that can use only daggers, that any amount of money and effort spent in the procuring of a really effective poison is worth it. I spent over 90,000 gold, and I haven't regretted a copper piece of it. All you magic users out there should devote some time and effort to the creation of new spells. It requires money and time, but when you have succeeded, you have a sellable item in the form of a spell only you have. I made a fourth level cold ray that really works great against all creatures, and especially those fire types. I particularly like what it does to red dragons. The list of possible spells to be made is endless, with only the limitation being your imagination. While we are dealing with magic, a set of extra spellbooks for the magic user is a must. Those things are too easy to destroy, steal, or lose. I know the cost is extreme, but considering their need for you to simply exist as a magic user, they are a must. My last bit of advice deals with the 8th level permanent spell. This spell, usually gotten with a scroll, has got to be the best spell there is, and every bit as good as a wish. I placed a fly spell on myself, and I made it permanent. Now gorges and chasms are ignored. I grab those floating treasures, and sometimes I escape the monster's grasp by simply going up. Friends of mine like Improvision, and Protection from Evil, in combination. The haste spell would be nice, but I've been told that it can cause heart failure, since the body is not made to stand the strain. Sometimes the magic user is lucky enough to charm an extra strong creature, and making the charm spell permanent works out great. Well, hope some of this helps those ever-suffering players in the dungeon where the judge is a real sadist. <laughs> so I just think that article was just really, really cool. Um, that had to be in the very early days of his playing, and I just, I really think that's awesome that he gives those tips and tricks and asks for more. Um, I know there were some dungeon articles that came along after these that kind of added more tips and tricks. Um, so if you get a chance to find those, um, go on uh, Google and do a search for the Ann Archive. Um, you can take a look at those PDFs of all those old Dragon magazines. Um, check a lot of those out. Um, I don't know anything about the copyright infringement on that or all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying that's, that's where I take a look at those for myself. Um, you judge for yourself as to how that might work out. Um, and someone can put in the comments if you actually do know about that copyright of that. And then I will be happy to uh, look into that myself and uh, get rid of those if, if that's not something I should be having my fingers on. But they're just really, really hard to find. Um, some of these old dragons are just not out there anymore. If you get them on eBay, they're just crazy high priced. Um, but these articles are so well worth reading. Um, there's another article that I'm going to cover next time uh, from the Sorcerer's Scroll written by Rob Kuntz. And it talks about Tolkien in Dungeons & Dragons. I, I think that's a great idea because I tend to run my games, um, my old school games, uh, in Tolkien-esque fashion or Tolkien-esque style. So there's a limited amount of racial choices for you to play. Uh, Throwback to first edition in that regard. Uh, BFRPG has that same thing in the regard. Um, I try not to use hardly any supplements, um, although my wife and kids pressure me to do so. <laughs> but I would prefer that you, uh, you keep monsters as monsters and uh, player characters as player characters and you don't mix and match those. Uh, but again, this is just the way I like to play. If it's not the way you like to play, hey, that's cool. Um, but I really enjoyed the reading this little article of the tips and tricks uh, from the semi-successful player by James Ward. I hope you've enjoyed that too. And uh, as uh, as Gary says in, in his older ones that I've read, hey, um, hope you like the stuff on the channel. But hey, uh, prosper and hey, good gaming. All right, take care. <laughs>